Okay, do. Okay. Uh, so next one hour, I'm going to talk about the monsoon, uh, monsoon and scale interactions. Uh, all the monsoon is global. Uh, I think uh, I have not enough time to cover everything. So mostly I will focus on uh, like Indian monsoon, South Asian monsoon, Southeast Asian monsoon, East Asian monsoon, and probably I'll slightly touch on the African monsoon and South American monsoon. So talking about the Indian monsoon, mostly South Asian monsoon, monsoon uh, we have uh, like uh, summertime wind coming to, to the Indian subcontinent, South, South Asia and bringing moisture and rainfall uh, to, to, to India and Southeast Asia. Uh, however, uh, during winter time, the winds are reversed. And that's why it is called monsoon, because winds reverse. And then northeasterly wind come in from like uh, Siberian region and northern high latitudes. And then um, when they come over Bay of Bengal, pick up some moisture, and that's why you get rain over eastern part of India. And this year it is uh, substantially higher. So, so most part of uh, Chennai, um, uh, this part of India is flooded. Uh, the monsoons are linked with uh, several processes. Um, I have uh, put some processes here and also climate modes. Uh, I just presented about the climate modes uh, this morning. Also, we talked about it yesterday. Uh, uh, cyclones are not directly related to the monsoons because during monsoon time we have strong winds here between uh, low level and high level. So the winds here doesn't allow cyclones to develop. That's why cyclones are not directly related uh, to monsoons uh, in the Indian Ocean. However, many studies have linked cyclones in Pacific. Like if you have more number of typhoons in Northeast Pacific, that diverts moisture from Indian Ocean. So that's why monsoon become weak sometimes due to um, high frequency variability in typhoons in the Northwest Pacific. Of course, we have the MJO and the intra-seasonal oscillations. And then the active phase, those are rela related actually, MJO, ISO, and active and break phases of the monsoon. And then, of course, we have the climate modes, Indian Ocean Dipole, the subtropical dipole. Ningalurino is not so much related. Elino Modoki, Elino, and the Indonesian through flow. The through flow affects the heat content of the basin, Indian Ocean. And in that way, it can influence the monsoon on several time scales, from interannual, multiannual, to, to decadal time scales. Let me start with. Uh, Indian monsoon ENSO IOD connections because ENSO has been thought to be the dominant influencer on the Indian monsoon. Uh, basically, the southern oscillation was discovered while Gilbert Walker was trying to understand why monsoon failed in late uh, 19th century and early 20th, 20th century. He was the director general of Indian Meteorological Department in early 20th century. And he was under pressure from the British government because British government was criticized for not, uh, not managing the droughts in India in late uh, 19th century. And there are several droughts and turning into famines and uh, mass mortality. And then while trying to relate the Indian summer monsoon index with several indices, because uh, he was uh, able to get all the data, meteorological data, from many stations all over the world, so at that time, he tried to correlate the Indian monsoon index with all those atmospheric uh, data he had. And at that time, he discovered that when there is a seesaw oscillation between Eastern Pacific and Western Pacific, like the difference between Tahiti and Darwin, uh, that index uh, could be related to monsoon. And, and then he found that, uh, uh, that that southern oscillation can explain some of the droughts in India. Of course, that time he also discovered NAO, <coughs> but NAO was not so much linked to the monsoon. And later, I think uh, uh, we have many studies uh, which also try to understand the ENSO monsoon relationship using paleo proxy rate records. Like in this study, Cook et al. 2010 tried to understand the monsoon variability uh, in relation to ENSO 
using tree ring data. So they extended the because we have limited number of observations and the record is not so long. So they used those proxy data to identify some of the mega droughts in 19th and 20th century, like they extended the record to uh, 1400, 1200. And then they found that uh, most of those uh, uh, droughts and floods are actually related to either Lanina phase of the ENSO or the Elino phase of the ENSO. And if you look at the present day, like this, these two are Indian monsoon um, rainfall patterns for 2006 and 2009. Both of them are Elino years. 2006 was an Elino year. 2009 also was an Elino year. If you look at those two rainfall uh, diagrams, you can see that 2006, uh, the the India, the most of the regions in India. Uh, received uh, quite normal rainfall, or sometimes even above normal rainfall. And the overall deficit for the whole India was only 1%, which is not much, considering that it is an Elino year. And considering that historically we know that Elino has strong influence, and whenever we have Elino, uh, India suffers from a drought. However, 2006 uh, was not so bad. Now compare that with 2009, another Elino year, 2009 was slightly different. Uh, 2009, we had Elino as well as Elino Modoki, kind of blended Elino and Elino Modoki year. And you can see here um, the whole India rainfall was minus 22% of normal. So very dry year uh, in last uh, 15 to 20 years. Although both are Elino years, one year was severe drought. The other one is not, was not so bad. And then compare that. I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. <laughs> Building it up. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then compare that with this year, 2015. 2015, uh, initially, we almost all models were predicting a very strong Elino. And some people even saying that it will exceed the 1997 event and called it a Godzilla event, Godzilla Elino. However, uh, if you look at the deficiency, the all India rainfall was minus 16%, less than, it's, it is, of course, it was dry, but less than 2009 event. And again, it was a strong Elino, quite comparable to 1997, although it is not as strong as 1997. And then this is the time series of all Indian rainfall from 1870 to 2010, taken from India Meteorological Department, uh, sorry, uh, IITM, uh, Homogeneous India, Indian Monthly Rainfall Index. And here the red circle means those are the Elino years. So basically you can see all the deficit years, below normal years, are related to Elinos. All are red circles here. Except for few events here, and mostly happening up to 1980s, so these three events, although it, those were Elino years, uh, the, the rainfall was not so, below, so much below normal. And that, as you were asking, is related to the Indian Ocean. This is the Indian Summer Monsoon Index in black line, uh, early 20th century, first 10 years of the 20th century. And the blue line is the Southern Oscillation Index discovered by Gilbert Walker, and he was the director general at that time. You can see that the correlation is almost one between them. The, the Indian summer monsoon rainfall and Southern Oscillation Index correlation is almost one when he was the director general. We don't know whether he played with the data, <laughs> which is mostly unlikely <laughs> because <laughs> pressure from the government and then correlate the same thing for the last 10 years of the 20th century. Okay, uh, 1990 to 1999. In this case, the correlation becomes 0 0.1, insignificant negligible. So that means the ENSO, the Southern Oscillation influence on monsoon is not so strong in the last part of the 20th century. And at that time, during here around 1999, 
we discovered that Indian Ocean also has its own oscillation, which we call the Indian Ocean dipole. And whenever we have Indian Ocean dipole, we also have a kind of seesaw oscillation between Eastern Indian Ocean and Western Indian Ocean. And, and when you have a positive Indian Ocean dipole, it will like divert the moisture from Eastern Indian Ocean, converse that to East, Western Indian Ocean and also India. So that's why the ENSO influence, which used to be like subsidence over India, was reduced by this kind of dipole in the Indian Ocean. And the correlation between the dipole index in the Indian Ocean uh, and the uh, Indian summer monsoon rainfall is 0 0.5. And schematically, you can explain that like, if you don't have Indian Ocean dipole, the, the Darwin high pressure becomes very high, widespread and covers parts of India. So that's why we have subsidence over India and less rainfall. However, if you have a dipole in the Indian Ocean, then that will reduce the impact of the Darwin pressure, high pressure here, high pressure anomalies, and then, then help uh, the Indian summer monsoons to revive even uh, with the early nose. And this is again the same story. Uh, uh, once we have a divergence from here, because of the cold anomalies, the convection over maritime continent will be suppressed, and uh, the divergence of moisture from that area will converse uh, to Western Indian Ocean as well as Indian monsoon trough. So that's why you get more rain uh, during positive Indian Ocean dipole. And that explains when the Indian summer monsoon rainfall and Elino correlation has decreased, the Indian summer monsoon rainfall and the uh, IOD correlation has increased, <coughs> became significant. We also observed that in proxy data, in this case we are using the coral records, uh, coral IOD index, the index taken from Victoria Lake, corals of Victoria Lake in Kenya, because Kenya gets more rain during positive Indian Ocean dipoles and get less rain during negative Indian Ocean dipoles. So that's why we have a dipole index taken from the coral records. We can extend the, the time series to, to 1880, 1890. And we see that when the Nino 3 and Indian summer monsoon rainfall index relationship decreased, the, the coral IOD and monsoon rainfall uh, correlation has increased. It was not that strong before 1940s and 50s. And we attribute that to the mode shifts or the decadal variability within the Indian Ocean dipole. Like before 1940s and 50s, uh, the, the dipole used to have a pentadal time scales, and before 1930s, it used to have like a decadal time scale. So it was not occurring so frequently before 1950s. But if you see after 1980s, we have kind of biennial uh, oscillations. The, the IOD became more biennial. So you almost expect every alternate year, say, positive Indian Ocean dipole. And even uh, if that happens, even if there is an Elino, the Indian monsoon doesn't suffer so much. So that's why the relationship between Indian monsoon and the dipole index became stronger after 1980s. Then how do you explain that behavior in the Indian Ocean dipole? Why we have so frequent Indian Ocean dipole in, in present decades? Uh, to some extent, we can explain that through the warming of the Indian Ocean. The whole Indian Ocean is warming because of the global warming. However, the western side of the Indian Ocean is warming uh, stronger or more than the eastern side. And that is creating some kind of background gradient between east and west, favoring more number of positive Indian Ocean dipoles. And that's why we, we start observing consecutive positive Indian Ocean dipole years uh, in recent time, which was not so much Actually, we didn't see any consecutive positive Indian Ocean dipole in, in the instru instrumental records uh, from like uh, early 20th century to, to almost end of 20th century. Only recently, like 2006, 2007, and 2008, all three years were positive Indian Ocean dipole. So we are, we are now experiencing a, a situation where we have, uh, we have a background state which favors more positive Indian Ocean dipoles. This is also <clears throat> this is also observed by another study done by Abram et al. Uh, from coral records taken from Sicily, 
as well as uh, Sumatra region. Uh, so they made a dipole index using uh, coral records from Cecil's and Sumatra. And from that index, they also found that uh, the positive Indian Ocean dipoles are intensified in, in present times. And uh, looking at the projections, also some studies like Chai et al. from Australia, they also used the CIMI-5 uh, model results to, to find that uh, we expect more number of extreme, uh, this, this they explain as extreme, EOF-1 as as their extreme events, extreme Indian Ocean Dipole events, and this is moderate Indian Ocean Dipole events. Uh, note that these are EOF, so you can always uh, turn around the patterns. But, and then they observed that compared to 20th century, the extreme number of dipole events can be seen in the 21st century. Actually, more number of extreme events can be expected in the 21st century based on those CIMI-5 uh, model experiments. So all those are indicating that we are in a state which is supporting more number of Indian Ocean Dipole, particularly positive Indian Ocean Dipoles. So why we are so concerned about Indian uh, Ocean Dipole? Because of the, not only the interlink with monsoon, but also because of its teleconnections to several parts of the world. In this case, I'm showing you how the positive Indian Ocean Dipole could be linked uh, to like uh, the European uh, summer conditions, heat waves in Europe. In 2003, uh, we had a positive Indian Ocean Dipole which only lasted for a couple of months. It started in uh, end of, around end of July and almost died by end of August. And that happened because of MGO, I'll show you that later. Uh, but at that time, what we observed, uh, when the Indian Ocean Dipole uh, came to a peak, the, the, the heat wave conditions over Europe were, were intensified. So the blocking high in Europe and the Indian Ocean Dipole were somehow linked on those uh, high frequency time scales, not on seasonal time scales. And then, uh, of course, at that time, we submitted a paper to Nature and it was immediately rejected. We came to know. Why? Because after some time, one paper was published saying that it's related to global warming. <laughs> However, <coughs> what we found later is that whenever we have a positive Indian Ocean dipole, as I said, the eastern side uh, become dry. We have subsidence and less convection. On the western side, you have uh, higher convection and more rainfall, particularly over the western Indian Ocean, India and Pakistan. And that rainfall, once we have that rainfall, the diabetic heating caused by uh, that rainfall can be projected onto the mid latitude jet stream. So once we have a uh, diabetic heating, and that can generate anomalies in the vorticity. And that can be advected onto or projected onto the, onto the jet stream, which will then act as a kind of anchor to carry that signal all the way around to Europe. Uh, through, through that jet stream, which we call the waveguide. I think we, we just uh, heard this morning about the Rossby waves. And these are the long Rossby waves. They propagate eastward. And the, the jet stream here, usually we have a jet stream here. Usually the jet stream is not elongated and not like circumglobal. But some years, they become quite strong and, and can be circumglobal. And that provides the anchor. To, for the signal to propagate eastward. Once we have a diabetic heating here, that will project onto the, onto the jet stream here and then propagate around the globe to, to reach uh, the, the eastern and western Europe and, and like support that blocking, blocking high. This is one of the reasons. Of course, there are several other reasons why you have a strong blocking high during those heat wave years over Europe. And one part of that uh, stream, uh, that uh, jet stream also goes uh, like to, to Arctic. And also some people link that to Arctic uh, sea ice melting. Now to support uh, that hypothesis, I am correlating the Indian Ocean Dipole Index with the Europe, European Dipole Index. So what we, what we did is like, 
because whenever we have blocking high, we also have a, a low system here. So we took a dive, we took an index by taking difference between Eastern Europe and Western Europe, and then correlate that with the IOD index for March, April, May, July, August, and September, October, November. So we can see that the dipole is highly correlated, 0.51 and 0.45 for the European dipole index and the Western Europe. It's not so much related to the Eastern European index. And compared to that, the Nino3 index correlation is not so high, uh, sorry, the, the, so yes, the Nino3 ENSO influence is not so high for the European dipole index and the Western Europe index, although it is quite high for the Eastern Europe index. And compared to those two tropical uh, climate modes, NO is not so well related. So it's quite, I think, um, logical to think that NO has not so significant influence uh, during summertime because NO is basically a strong phenomena, phenomenon during uh, winter time. As I was mentioning you, the one part of that jet stream uh, like wave, wave train goes all the way to the, to the Arctic and in one paper Krishnamurti at all recently said that this pathway can be related to rapid uh, Arctic ice melting. So recent ice melting in the, in the Arctic could be related to monsoon activities, uh, strong monsoon activities and probably those are where we've those were related to the Indian Ocean dipoles. The wave train also can be seen in southern hemisphere, and we find that the Indian Ocean dipole related to the monsoon activity over the tropical Indian Ocean can be traced to, to La Plata region. Like we have, whenever we have positive Indian Ocean dipole, we get depth sea rain in southern Brazil, but enhanced rain in northern uh, Argentina. And that also verified in the syntax F simulations, the, the, the coupled model we presented yesterday that also simulated the same phenomenon. Okay, besides teleconnections, we also have direct influence of monsoon on the, on the rainfall of Southeast Asia. In one of the studies recently, we saw that uh, the March, April, May, and September, October November rainfall of Indochina Peninsula here, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, in that region, that rainfall is more related to the monsoon activities over, over the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean compared to uh, La Nina or El Nino in the tropical Pacific. And that sometimes explains, like, like if you have a strong westerlies uh, in the Bay of Bengal, that can charge the monsoon and also charge the also produce rainfall and charge all the fields. So whenever you have a kind of cyclone uh, followed by that monsoon event, we expect uh, this kind of floods like what we saw in 2011, Thai, Thai flood. Coming to the predictability, <coughs> like we saw yesterday, <coughs> most of the predictability uh, in coupled model simulations uh, can be seen in surface temperature rather than rainfall. Uh, the, the, the predictability is higher in surface temperature compared to rainfall. So that's why uh, we have trouble to get high predictability um, in monsoon rainfall. As you can see here, just I'll flip those two again and again. You can see that the, the, the anomaly correlations or the skills are pretty high um, for all the seasons. December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, and September, October, November. You can see that the scale is pretty high uh, for the tropical um, temperatures, but it's not so high for, for, the, for the rainfall. Uh, it remains quite high for the December, January, February rainfall in tropical Pacific, but not so high for the June, July, August. Particularly, it's not so high in the Indian Ocean sector. It's uh, the skill score from our model, and we can see the same thing in the multimodal ensembles, um, like the, the study done by Bin Wang. Uh, again, the June, July, August skills for precipitation is not so high 
in the Indian Ocean region, although it's somewhat high for the December, January, February when you do the multi-model ensembles. Now, Kulkarni et al. did uh, one study in which they tried to compare the predictability skills of monsoon rain for, for, from several models. Uh, this is the syntax frontier model from Jamstack. And then they come here and probably some other model. Uh, <clears throat> what you can see here is that most of the models were doing somewhat okay for the, for the rainfall of the foothills of Himalaya. Like the northern provinces of India, uh, most models were doing okay, mainly because those rainfalls are related to large-scale monsoon trough activity. So because it is large scale, the models, coupled models with 100 kilometer resolutions were able to capture uh, the, the rainfall variability in that region. And the predictability was quite okay, although not so high, 0 0.4 to 0 0.5. However, you can see that there was no predictability skill uh, in the middle part of India, central India. And those part of India, they get most of their rainfall from monsoon disturbances. Monsoon disturbances, monsoon low pressure systems, and also the uh, transient variability in the trough itself. And most of those disturbances come from Bay of Bengal and travel across the central India, and sometimes they go also to, the, uh, to Pakistan. So, so that those high frequency variabilities are not captured by the model predictions. So that's why the, the skill score of uh, model predictions were low over central India compared to northern part and southern part, which were mostly related to large scale climate variations. This is one of the examples where uh, the syntax frontier model, which we are using in Jamstack, failed to, to, to capture the monsoon rainfall over India. This is the case in 2013. Uh, we had a negative Indian Ocean dipole, which is uh, somewhat okay with the observation. This is observation, and these two are model predictions. And model was capturing quite well that negative Indian Ocean dipole. And whenever we expect a negative Indian Ocean dipole, usually the monsoon rainfall is not so high. Uh, it's below normal. But it's also modul modulated by La Nina conditions. If, if you have a La Nina with a negative Indian Ocean dipole, the monsoon uh, tends to be normal. Although the model was capturing those SST anomalies well, including the La Nina condition in the tropical Pacific, the rainfall was not well captured, actually. Uh, it was uh, getting a negative anomalies for June, July, August, uh, whereas it was observed that we had positive rain and above normal rain, actually, during that year. And that's, again, related to the teleconnections uh, uh, coming from tropical Indian and Pacific Oceans, because sometimes model is not capturing the right phase and right space of the tropical convection. So that's why the teleconnection, teleconnections sometimes get wrong. Okay, so these are the challenges uh, uh, to improve the regional rainfall predictions. And most important thing is to get those high frequency variabilities in the model predictions and then the intra-seasonal oscillations. In addition to that, we also have some variations on decadal time scales, like the Indian Ocean is warming, and because of that, we have some changes in the, in the, in the walker circulation and also in the Pacific uh, decadal conditions. So we have more like La Nina conditions now because of the Indian Ocean warming and also because of the extratropical uh, variabilities. And those things uh, need to be captured by the model uh, in order to get um, in order to get those uh, monsoon rainfall predictability uh, correct. Okay, so next is the mon NGO interactions. So this morning I presented you NGO, so I don't have to uh, tell you the <laughs> basics of NGO. You already have that. And uh, we find that MJO or MJOs also interact with uh, Indian Ocean Dipole and directly and indirectly with the monsoon. And this is one of the studies where uh, Rao and Amagata showed that 
the Indian Ocean dipoles were terminated um, in the years which were not associated with Elinos, 1961, 1967, 1994, and 2003, all those four Indian Ocean dipole years were not related to ENSO. And in those years, as you were asking yesterday, in those years, the, the dipole was terminated by a, a MJO phase in the Indian Ocean. So whenever we have MJO, that will kick in um, the downwelling Kelvin waves because you have strong westerlies, which uh, causes convergence in the tropical equatorial Indian Ocean. And that converging uh, pattern, which will cause high heat content because of, uh, because of depending on the thermocline, and that high heat will move to Sumatra coast and will kill the positive Indian Ocean dipole. During a positive Indian Ocean dipole, the Sumatra coast, we have upwelling and cold anomalies. So if you have warm anomalies coming from the west because of the MJOs, that will terminate the positive Indian Ocean dipole. And that's why that is what is observed during 1961, 1967, 1994, 2003. All those years were not related to Illinois years. Significant one is the 2003. Usually, we don't see MJO during June, July, August. MJO is very active during December, January, February, and March, April, May, basically. However, some years, we do get MJOs in June, July, August, and 2003 is one of the years. Actually, it's a good news. It was a good news for Europe. Because of that MJO, the dipole got killed, and the heat wave suddenly dis uh, subsided after that event. We also see the same kind of thing <coughs> in the model simulations. Um, uh, like, uh, I forgot to tell you one thing. Uh, during, the, during the years when the dipoles are accompanied or concurrent with Elinos, like 1982 and 1997, we don't see MJO activities. So those years, the IOD, IOD is gets terminated because of the change in the monsoon wind in the maritime continent. When the winter monsoon sets in, that will uh, like kill the upwelling uh, zone in Sumatra region and will, will help downwelling, so the dipole will get terminated during those years. So indirectly, you can see that Elino and also M Elino and MJ are also linked. So usually during Elino years, we don't see uh, much MJ activities in the Indian Ocean during November, December. This was also uh, seen in the model simulations. These are the model years, not necessarily related to, the, related to the calendar years. And you can see all those years which were not related to model Elinos also were terminated by the MJOs in the model simulations. Okay, so how MJO influences uh, monsoon rains? Uh, one example here, this is unpublished work, so I'm not going into the details of this. <clears throat> one of our colleagues from Malaysia found that uh, the phase of MJOs are somehow linked to the peninsular Malaysian rainfall, their monsoon uh, in, in December, uh, November, December. And particularly they found that uh, phase four and phase five, after phase three, when the, mon when the MJO moves into peninsular Manis Malaysia here, during phase four and phase five, uh, particularly their west coast get more rain uh, during those MJO phases. Uh, the Indian monsoon is not so much linked directly to MJO, but it's linked to what we call boreal summer interseasonal oscillations, which move northward. Uh, as you can see, MJO move eastward, but these ISOs uh, in the Indian Ocean move northward, and that influence uh, the rainfall, uh, Indian monsoon rainfall, and also Southeast Asian monsoon rainfall. So here is a comparison uh, given uh, in the MJO working group in WMO, uh, MJO versus by um, boreal summer interseasonal oscillations, also called as Monsoon Intraseasonal Oscillations, MISO. <coughs> okay, compare, <coughs> comparing MJO, 
usual MJO move eastward and they are 30 to 60 day modes. Uh, whereas boreal summer months, um, boreal summer intraseasonal oscillations move northward. Uh, like once we have uh, some anomaly here, they move northward, uh, northward or northwestward, and then help the rainfall, active phase of the rainfall over India. Um, the, there's, there are two types of uh, boreal summer intraseasonal oscillations and some of them are also 30 to 60 day and the other ones were bi-weekly and they move northward or northwestward and they affect the monsoon onsets, active and break phases as well as uh, the whole season's rainfall. And the possible source for those seasonal climate predictability um, can be uh, investigated by making an index like the RMMA, RMM for the MJOs. This is the BIOSO 1, <coughs> which is usually 30 to 60 days more, and related to the UAF 1 and UAF 2, which explains like 7.2% of variability and 4.9% of variability. They are kind of statistically separated, 7.2 and 4.9. They are statistically separated. However, can be can be considered as a kind of a single mode with two different phases. One is a kind of dipole-like structure. The other one is quadrupole-like structure. And the the first UF mode is more related to the Indian Ocean trough here, whereas the second mode is more related to the India uh, Indian Ocean and Northwest Pacific. And both of them move northward or northeastward. So that's why they are more related to the Indian monsoon. And maybe they are also a kind of uh, manifestations of Rossby waves. In this case, uh, short Rossby waves moving eastward. Oh, sorry, moving, moving uh, westward. And then uh, we have the BIOSO2, which is more like a 10 to 30 days mode or bi-weekly mode. And they are mostly related to like pre-monsoon and monsoon onset. Also sometimes they are related to extreme uh, rainfall event over uh, India and Southeast Asia. It's again like front-like thing. So the UAF3 and UAF4, they are not so well separated, so I think they are both kind of same thing. <coughs> UAF3 is more related to Southeast Asia, and UAF4 is more related to East Asia. So UAF3 has a kind of influence over South China and probably Malaysia and Philippines, and UAF4 is more related to China and Japan uh, monsoon rainfall during June, July, August. And in one of the studies, they found that 68% <clears throat> of the onset dates for the Indian monsoon can be explained by phase two to four of BIOSO2. And 70% of the onset dates can be explained for the South China Sea uh, by this phase three to phase two to four, uh, like these phases, uh, BIOSO2. And some, some of the biases are also related to extreme rainfall events, uh, like you can see here over southern China and Vietnam, we have uh, extreme rainfalls associated with uh, um, five to seven days bias modes. Coming to the predictability, <coughs> this is one of the work uh, where Abilas is uh, involved. Uh, done in IITM, uh, and in this studies, in this study they try to find out the predictability skill in CFS uh, simulations uh, for 2001, 2003, 2007, and 2009. Uh, you can see that skill score above 0.6, um, up to 15 days, skill score is above, above 0.6 
for uh, the MISO-1 and MISO-2, they call the BIOSO and BIOSO-1 and BIOSO-2 as MISO-1 and MISO-2. Those are basically similar. Uh, monsoon intra-seasonal oscillations, first mode and second mode. And both modes, uh, uh, you can see here, uh, the model has some skills to predict both modes uh, up to 15 days, 15 to 20 days ahead. <coughs> and that's uh, about the predictability of the MJOs and the monsoons. Coming to the African monsoon, <coughs> I'm not an expert in African monsoon, so I'm trying to explain. Please correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong. <clears throat> uh, we have the East African monsoon, which is related to the shift in the ITCZ in the Indian Ocean, whereas the Western Pas West African monsoon is related to the ITCZ in the Atlantic. And this part of the monsoon um, is somewhat well understood because uh, there are several studies which try to link the ITCG movement here, the subtropical high in the Indian Ocean and, and the dipole in the Indian Ocean. So what we observe is that whenever we have a dipole here, East Africa gets more rain, so the monsoon becomes strong on this side. And whenever we have a, we have, whenever the subtropical high moves slightly north, uh, slightly southward, the ITCG also become active and we get more rain on the eastern side. The western side is uh, less understood, and as Adrian was telling this morning in 2007, uh, although it was uh, La Nina year, the, the monsoon was delayed, and that was related uh, to the regional patterns, uh, yeah, patterns of rainfall here, uh, sorry, the SST here. The SST, meridional mode of the SST in the tropical Atlantic uh, is, seems to be more related to the onset and the seasonal rainfall over West Africa. But some of those years are also related to El Nino and La Nina. But the regional pattern cannot be neglected. And without that, I think the predictions uh, goes wrong. Even this year, they had a problem. Even though it's an El Nino year, and uh, many models were predicting very dry uh, West African monsoon, but it, it was not so dry mainly because of the regional patterns. Yes, yes. It's mainly because the SST anomalies uh, of Africa were quite warm, and that retained uh, the monsoon in that area. And then coming to South America <coughs> here, we also have a monsoon, but this is again in January. Uh, notice that the West African monsoon is uh, in July, whereas East African monsoon is in January because ITCG move southward during uh, southern summer. <coughs> and similarly for the South, Afri South American monsoon, it's also in January and in southern hemisphere summertime. And again, that is related more to the subtropical high variability in the southern Atlantic. Uh, com compared to Elino. Most people think Elino influenced that. It's quite possible through the teleconnections, but the subtropical high also cannot be neglected. The trough is very much related to the subtropical high in southern Atlantic. Now, studies are not, not so much for that region, mainly because <coughs> the models are not doing well for the Atlantic. Most of the models, <coughs> have trouble to find the east-west zonal gradient in the tropical Atlantic. This black line here is showing you the east-west SST gradient, annual SST gradient. Uh, as you can see, the, the western side is warm and the eastern side is cold with slight dip uh, in the central Atlantic. Most of the model we have given here a few examples, but most of the models do it just opposite. Western side is warm. So most of the models have bias on the eastern side. And that affects the monsoon as well as the meridional mode, which influence again the monsoon. And also the South American uh, monsoon here. And um, the Amazon rainfall also affected by that. 
and that is a big issue and we don't know yet what are the reasons. Some people uh, say that it's related to the convection over Amazon. Some people say that it's related uh, to the ocean dynamics, which is not well captured in those models. And my experience says that it's also related to the subtropical high. The St. Helena high is very much related to that because most of the model is not capturing that well or it, they're putting it mo more towards north. And that's why we have warm anomalies on African coast. Okay, to summarize, <coughs> the Asian monsoons are interlinked with uh, basin scale climate uh, such as Enso Indian Ocean Dipole. I didn't have time to go into the subtropical Indian Ocean Dipole. And there is also a dipole in the southern Indian Ocean, and that also influenced the monsoon through Mascarene High, because the high over the southern Indian Ocean is also linked to the monsoon through the hardly circulation. And the subtropical dipole in the southern Indian Ocean also influenced that, uh, Mascarene High, and influenced the monsoon indirectly. And also there is some link, I think you were asking uh, this morning, there, is, there are some studies which shows NO also could be linked to, to the Indian monsoon through that middle latitude wave train. <clears throat> and uh, in turn, monsoon influences Europe, Arctic, South America, and many other places. And the interlink seems to be affected by Indian Ocean warming, uh, which we saw slightly in the proxy, da proxy data. And the monsoons are affected by MGO and MISO and BIOSOS, so again, we need to improve the model predictability for MISO and BIOSOS. Model source promises in capturing the source of influences, like models are almost doing well to, cap to predict Elino, Indian Ocean dipoles, but the teleconnections are still in, in not up to the mark. So we have to improve the teleconnections and also improve the right place for the convections in the tropical Indian and Pacific Oceans. The East African monsoon is better simulated by models, however, they are not so well simulated for the West African and South American monsoon, mainly because of the model biases in, in the tropical Atlantic. I'll stop there. Thank you if you have any questions. <coughs>